proud to have um, Mike Adams on with us. He's presented for us before. He's very popular. Uh, for those of you that don't know Mike, he is, uh, make sure I got the title right, Mike, Vice President of Underwriting at the Vemco. Is that correct? Correct. Mm -hmm. And a good guy. When you call a Vemco and you dial the 800 number, every once in a while the boss answers the phone and takes a credit card number from you. I, I, I just am so impressed by that. So, and it's a obviously a Vemco is good friends of ours. They, uh, they, uh, most of you know this. If you don't, they uh, have a wonderful policy for our members, and uh, it's been a great, uh, great association for the past few years. And we're really glad to have you here, Mike. Oh, good. Well, I'm uh, happy to be. Uh Presenting again, although recognizing some of the names out there, it always makes me a little nervous. So uh, I'll try not to picture everyone sitting there in their underwear, which is one of the public speaking tricks, and uh, we <laughs> can uh, get through this this evening. All right. You, are you ready to go? Uh, yes, I am. Go ahead and uh, switch over, and then if you can tell me if you just have a screen with a uh, plane flying towards you and the, the pilot, the title, what kind of pilot runs out of gas? Just there it sure is. I've got this is what I went through for everybody. The last time I, I last time I uploaded somebody's G1000, this is what I went through. So, Mike, don't feel bad. All right. Okay. So, right. hopefully, everyone has just the screen. You don't see all my notes and things off to the side. So, you're looking at a gorgeous picture with either a sunrise or a sunset, depending upon which coast you're on. <laughs> yes. All right. We got it, Mike. Okay. All right. Uh, but what I'll do this evening, um, I lost a little bit of time, but we'll uh, run the program for about uh, 30 to 35 minutes, and uh, then we'll open it up for questions after that. And as the, uh, the promo said, uh, you get the uh, pleasure of the insurance expertise and what it's like to have been a pilot gone through training and looking back on my training versus uh, what kind of accidents we're seeing now. So let's go ahead and uh, get started. Uh, this afternoon, uh, or this evening, well, I'm going to start here with this photo, one because it's rather captivating, and uh, it's probably, if we could read the pilot's mind who is safely out of the airplane, as is the entire crew, it's probably the only time a pilot's thought that they've had too much fuel on board. No. Wow. That, that, was the a little more, that was the one near Chicago. A little Chicago. more history on this, if you're curious. Uh, the end number on this airplane is 309 Tango Hotel. It was owned by the Liberty Foundation. Uh, they had a fuel leak in flight. Uh, they made an off-field landing out near Oswego, Illinois. Uh, unfortunately, the field was very wet, and so the local fire department didn't want to run their uh, fire trucks out into the field and get them stuck, but they didn't want to have anything else burn up, so they all stood back and watched this gorgeous airplane uh, burn, burn up. And you can see the fire bottle in the foreground. Uh, but that was a tragic loss back in uh, 2011. So on to that. Well, Bob, you introduced me, so we can uh, skip that a little bit. Uh, what I've got are uh, three scenarios, and I might have a fourth depending upon time. And, and this first one is a, uh, a flight from uh, Billings, Montana to Hillsboro, uh, Oregon. And uh, normally I'll ask a show of hands in the audience if people would have flown in the Pacific Northwest. So I'll just assume that uh, some of us have, some of us haven't. But as you can see from the, uh, the line out here, we've got Billings, Montana. And then it's a nice straight shot uh, going westbound. And we all recognize the uh, charts there for some altitudes and all. And then as we proceed further in towards Hillsboro, Oregon, the terrain gets a little nicer here. This is uh, the uh, Tri-Cities area. This is getting, coming down through the Columbia Gorge. Uh, you get to navigate across the, the Portland metropolitan area and then across the west hills of Portland, navigating through some uh, radio towers, and finally get to land at Hillsboro. So uh, leaving Billings, heading westbound, uh, the terrain eventually gets uh, a little bit friendlier for you. So on this uh, trip, um, here's um, some flight planning that I did. Uh, standard 182 has 56 usable gallons. Uh, as a crow flies, it's about 603 nautical miles. And uh, I figured, well, flight time is going to be about 4 hours and 20 minutes. And from prior experience, I guesstimated 12 gallons, 12.2 gallons per hour. Uh, this 12.2 uh, is interesting. Uh, as soon as you put a decimal point on a number, it suddenly becomes more believable, even if it's an estimate. 
So here I just deluded myself into thinking, I've got an accurate number here that I can calculate this trip with because it's 12.2 instead of saying about 12 or 13 gallons. So if I ran this out, I would figure out that I'd burn about 52 gallons of fuel, which would leave me about four gallons of fuel, which if I cut the uh, power back to 45%, gives me maybe 20 to 30 minutes of flight time, which might keep me almost legal. And as we all know, 45% power in a 182 is pretty excruciatingly slow, but it would meet the, uh, the uh, minimums for the uh, FARs possibly. So in reality, you go out and we take a look at the uh, pilot operating handbook, and it gives me a little bit of conflicting information. At 10,000 feet, well, it gives information that's conflicting with what I want it to be. It says at 10,000 feet, I can go 565 nautical miles, which is 40 plus miles short of where I really need to be. And on 55 gallons of usable fuel, I've got 5.1 hours that I can fly at this uh, power setting and range, which is actually less time than I calculated for my flight trip. So now I've got this rationalization that we pilots all make, and that's that, gee, I've got one figure that supports what I want to do and think it'll do, and I've got another one that conflicts with it. And um, I think in some of the science experiments uh, and stuff when we come up with a theory, everyone supports or accepts the facts that support their theory, and they ignore the truth if it doesn't support what they want it to say. So anyway, here we are uh, with these figures. Now, a couple of other factors that I, I put in here is that uh, I was flying, uh, it's a week-long trip. Uh, I'd been out at some uh, local shows, uh, had some business promotional materials. You've seen our attractive Avemco hats. Back in those days, they had buttons on the top, so they were a little more difficult to give away, but we still had them. I had a small tabletop display, a week's worth of clothes, an emergency kit, and a, a half case of oil uh, that I carried in the back of the plane. Now, this is a rental 182. And I always thought that the uh, FBO was telling me something about the condition of the engine by making me take that half case of oil. Uh, eventually, they admitted that, uh, no, Mike, we've seen you try and land this plane before, and we figured the extra weight back in the baggage compartment would help you out. So we had a half case of oil that I lugged around. <clears throat> now, one uh, note on this, and we talked about here are some things that might help uh, flight instructors, is this trip, you know, I'm fairly lightly loaded. The majority of my flying was myself or with an instructor, so I wasn't carrying a real heavy load. And what we've found from some accidents at Avemco is all of us pilots go through our transition training in whatever plane it is, and it's generally us in the uh, CFI. And then if we have a larger airplane, we finally get to take that long-awaited, dreamed-for flying vacation. So we take our airplane, and we load it up to gross takeoff weight, and that's the first time we've ever flown that plane at gross takeoff weight. We don't know what it's going to fly like. We can read the book, but it still gets pilots into trouble. So if you're transitioning someone into a larger plane, uh, particularly a six-seat plane or more, it's got capacity, when you get towards the end of their training, you really ought to give them some time at gross takeoff weight. Now, you may see out on some chat rooms that, boy, my insurance company made me endanger all my friends by saying I need to fly at gross takeoff weight. Well, we're not saying load up the plane with all your airport buddies and put their lives in danger. You can find a lot of other heavy items that you can strap down in airplanes to get to a heavier weight. Or if you are going to take your friends for a ride, make sure it's at the end of the training and all you're doing is getting them used to gross takeoff operations in a safe environment. But that is one of the things we see, particularly with the 206s and the 207s, some of the Cherokee sixes and things like that. So if you're working with someone in a transition in those planes, please stress and make sure that they get some gross takeoff uh, weight training. Okay, well, here's some other factors getting back to this uh, trip from uh, Billings to uh, Hillsboro. One, I wasn't heavy loaded. I figured that higher is better. Uh, I calculated at 10,000 feet, but if I could get up to um, 11.5 or 12.5, because I'm westbound, uh, that's even better to cross some of those mountains. Traditionally, we've got winds out of the west. Sometimes they're strong, sometimes they're light. If we have high pressure, we'll have a little bit of a northwest uh, component. Uh, there might be some sightseeing, because uh, what you couldn't really see on the uh, chart is it got 
fairly close to Yellowstone Park and Jackson Hole, and you might wander around and look at some of that area, plus the uh, Columbia Gorge. And then we had an external pressure, and uh, John and Martha talk quite often about external pressures on what that causes uh, pilots to do or not do. Uh, the other thing that was in on this is, now this is back in the day before we all had cell phones, and when I took a trip and rented a plane for a week or so, I had to leave with the flight school the town I was staying in each night, probably the hotel or a phone number that I was at, what FBOs I was calling on, and my route of flight. So when they knew where I was and that I'd bring the plane back. Well, about halfway through the trip, they did track me down and uh, asked what time I was going to be back on Friday. And I said, well, I can probably be back about midday. And they said, oh, hey, that's terrific because we have a customer that wants to take the plane out at 1.30 in the afternoon, and are you sure you can do the midday? Well, as a pilot, as soon as someone says, are you sure you can do this, our human nature is that, well, of course I can. So I agreed to have the plane back by midday on Friday. So there's an external pressure out there that suddenly came up that said, I've got a time frame rather than having what I had originally flight planned or thought about having till 5 p.m. Friday afternoon. Uh, the other thing is that I was ready to be through with the trip. It was a uh, you know, hard five days uh, bouncing around in uh, Montana in the middle of summer, and uh, it would have been nice to be back to uh, my home in Portland. So I started to do the tragic thing that uh, often comes up as I started to think like a passenger rather a, than a pilot. And you can use this in talking to your, your trainees or your clients. What we found is when we start to think like passengers, we concentrate on getting there at any cost. When we think like a pilot, our job is to get the airplane from point A to point B safely. And if we can't do that safely without any mishaps, we're not going to make the trip. Whereas the passenger's goal is to get there. And I was starting to think like a passenger in this case. So. Uh, well, we, we took off, and uh, at the end of the trip, uh, when I survived, obviously, um, I found out several things uh, about myself in, uh, in flying and fuel management. Uh, one, that self-discipline is very, very critical in this, and you have to figure out what you can and can't do. So I've now set that I'm always going to land with at least one hour of fuel remaining. Um, I'm going to stop halfway through the long legs of the trip, but no more than, six, no more than three hours uh, on it. Um, if I have to land for gas, and I flight plan to buy gas somewhere, you get the gas. You don't decide to go on to the next airport or something. We've all read stories of where someone got somewhere at night, uh, they didn't have the fuel there, et cetera. They suddenly decided that they had enough gas to get to some future airport that they couldn't get to when they did their initial flight planning. And we all know how that doesn't work out quite right. And then we also have, need to plan for the unplannable and I need to start to plan for the effects of altitude, temperature, and turbulence. And uh, most people, when they bring this up, they think, well, yeah, we know how it's going to affect the airplane. And actually, the airplane will be fine with all of that as soon as we calculate properly for temperatures and headwinds and density altitudes and things. What we have to plan for is how it affects us as the human being. And when you uh, bounce around at uh, 12,500 feet, just so you're kind of legal and not legal going up and down with the uh, thermals and all, uh, you start to make pretty dumb decisions. So we need to calculate what it's like to sit behind a hot engine on a hot day, even at 10,000 feet. If we go with a three degree adiabatic lapse rate, that's still pretty warm up there out in uh, parts of Montana. So I need to pay attention to those, and uh, so I set some parameters on that. Now, we all know what the FARs are about fuel. We can recite them for day VFR. We can cite them for night IFR if we're instrument rated. We know them for the instrument rules with the alternatives and things. If you're a helicopter pilot or rotorcraft, you know all of those rules. So we know all that. The question is, do we really follow it? And uh, Dr. Bill Rhodes, uh, who did some studies with us, made a very interesting comment on uh, education and training. And that's that we as pilots, are very well trained, and we often know what to do. But for some reason, we seldom do what we need to do. We continue on with what we originally planned, even though we know that the plan isn't going quite right. So in hey Mike, planning can I, can I jump in? Pardon? I'm sorry, I, I interrupted. I just, can I just jump in with one thing here? Sure. 
on your on your lessons learned. I just I want to do it while it's fresh. I know we normally do it at the back, but I just want to share one quick thing personally. Uh, last year, coming back from Oshkosh, going down to St. Louis, uh, we stopped to drop somebody off uh, at an airport in central Illinois, and the plan was to fill up a 182. And it was exactly what you described. The fuel pump was bro- was broken. We couldn't get we couldn't get, couldn't get gas. And it, I don't know how many hours of dual given I had at the time, several thousand, and beating this in the student's head. It took every effort of will, will to say, no, I'm not running. Over. It wasn't central Illinois, it was south of Chicago. They took every effort of will to say, no, I'm not running over Gary to buy gas. Mm-hmm. We'll sit here. Yeah. So it, we're all susceptible. I just wanted to bring that, reinforce your point. All right. Yeah, thank you, Bob. Uh, very good. In fact, uh, there's a uh, an FAA fellow that used to be based out in Portland, Oregon, and managed to uh, uh, kill himself in a bonanza. Uh, anyone that's been in the Portland area, this is a little bit of a side on the fuel, uh, may know where Fort Vancouver is. It's uh, just north of the Columbia uh, on the opposite side from uh, Portland, Oregon, and there's Pearson Air-, Air Park there. And at the time, they had a pretty good bonanza mechanic, and so a lot of the uh, Bonanza owners in Oregon went across to Washington, had their maintenance and annuals done, and then they'd fly home. Now, this particular fellow had his airplane based at Sandy Air Park, which is just east of uh, Portland up the gorge, and had discounted fuel for uh, its uh, tenants. Well, the plane came out of annual in Vancouver. Uh, The flying distance is maybe 25 miles is all, just a hopping up and over and you're down. The fellow thought he was low on fuel, but decided he didn't want to pay those outrageous Washington state taxes on fuel and things, and thought he could get back to Sandy with it. Well, he got within about three miles and ended up uh, killing himself in an off-field landing. So, uh, you know, there's a classic example of there was fuel there, it cost a little bit more, and so pay that little bit extra for whatever you need to get that uh, insurance in your fuel tank. But back to uh, flying from Billings to uh, Hillsboro, uh, we got a plan for lousy weather. Uh, and I was fortunate on uh, most of these trips that it worked out pretty well. But for those, this here is uh, probably Mount Adams down here. Uh, this is probably Mount uh, Rainier up in this area. And uh, actually, Mount Rainier is more up here, so that would be Adams, St. Helens, Hoods down here, and then the Oregon Cascades. Portland is just right about there, and you can see it's kind of fogged in a little bit. Uh, quite often in the, uh, the wintertime, sometime in the spring and the falls, the Willamette Valley through here, the I-5 corridor, gets a nice thick fog bank that never burns off when forecast. So uh, when making trips with uh, planning your fuel, you need to figure out where else you can go if the weather doesn't cooperate uh, with the, uh, the way it should change. So, Bob, you'd mentioned... Uh, you know, if you land somewhere and there's no fuel, you wait until you get the fuel there. That's absolutely true. Uh, the other thing I found out is that uh, if you're uh, going somewhere to get the fuel, it never hurts to carry cash because even though we're in a connected world nowadays, sometimes cash is the only way you can buy the fuel. Uh, my experience with that was Eastern Oregon, or excuse me, Eastern Washington. It was listed as fuel at the uh, airfield. It was a stop that I could make. There was fuel there, and it was available. Uh, the trouble is the fuel all belonged to a low, local aerial applicator who managed the airport. The fuel was really for his use in his business, but he was willing to sell it if you had the cash. So uh, fortunately, I had just enough cash to buy at that time about 10 gallons, which got me on to the next airport where I could uh, use the company credit card to uh, fill up the plane and finish out the trip. So. Uh, in planning your fuel uh, consumption, you ought to also plan on carrying some cash to make sure you get it. And if it's empty and it's not there, then you wait till they get it. Um, plan for closed runways. Uh, those of us that have been around for a while might remember uh, Bill Clinton's famous haircut out in Los Angeles. Uh, we had a situation of what closed an airport in Aurora, Oregon, which is just south of uh, Portland, and uh, anyone that uh, has done any flying into the vans, RVs, uh, or things, their factory is now at uh, the Aurora Airport. But what happened at Aurora was uh, a series of student pilots were doing touch and goes. There was a uh, Piper Arrow in the pattern, which happened to be insured by Avemco Insurance, and a Cessna 210 uh, 
was flying up from the south. Everyone was landing from the north. And if you remember, Barry Schiff wrote an interesting article once uh, in a magazine that got a lot of comments. And he basically said, there isn't anything in the FARs that say you can't do a straight in to an uncontrolled airfield. It's not the smartest thing to do, but it's not illegal. Well, the 210 uh, pilot called a straight in about seven miles out. The students cleared out. Uh, my pilot in the uh, Piper Arrow was on final, pulled up the gear and initiated to go around, got back into the pattern, thought about it for a minute, and it kind of irritated him. So what do we as pilots on Unicoms do when we're irritated? Well, we talk to the offending pilot, and we know we let them know what we think of their piloting ability or their decision making. Well, the, the, the 210 pilot landed on eventfully, went away. The Piper Arrow uh, pilot, though, unfortunately came back, forgot to extend the gear because he was still upset and distracted and closed the runway with a gear up landing. Now, we still had three students that were out there waiting for the ability to come in and land. Uh, fortunately, they all had enough fuel that they could wait for everyone to run out, pick up the Piper Arrow, drop the wheels, and push it off the side of the runway. So that, for three students, was a rather educational experience of how you handle things in an emergency, and uh, what do you do when the runway gets closed. Fortunately, there were several airports within close proximity that the students could have gone and landed at had they run into a fuel problem. And uh, I don't know how the CFIs would hand, uh, handle a uh, short solo uh, cross country with a landing in another airport if they'd say uh, no blood, no foul, or if they'd have to sign something uh, retroactively. But they didn't have to do that. Everyone was able to land uh, back at Aurora. OK, well, another thing that came up uh, with fuel and fuel management is uh, if we're running into a problem, uh, don't be afraid to tell ATC what's happening. Uh, a couple of magic words that ought to be stressed is you can start out the conversation with minimum fuel, and that will get you uh, some priority, and then you can escalate it to an emergency. Uh, any paperwork that gets done as a follow-up is, I can tell you, a lot less than the paperwork involved with handle, handle, having an aircraft claim uh, settled with the insurance company and taking a check ride or having your student or client take a check ride with the FAA because they uh, ran out of fuel uh, and landed off field. Now here's generally when we talk about uh, always have a plan and fly like a pro. Uh, for anyone that uh, has read about the Avianca Flight 52, it's rather interesting uh, out there, uh, kind of in a nutshell. Uh, this is a flight that originated uh, down south. Uh, the winds were pretty terrible. Uh, in route, that flight had three different holds, totaling an hour and 17 minutes due to weather and congestion at uh, JFK. And uh, eventually, uh, they did, after shooting several approaches and not getting in, uh, ran out of fuel and uh, they crashed off the airport. Uh, the NTSB report, um, kind of in their defense, said, well, maybe the loss could have been uh, mitigated had there not been a bit of a language barrier. The flight crew said they declared an emergency but there wasn't anything on the ATC tapes to that effect. But it is a, an example of where groups were knowing that things were not going as planned, and yet back when they had chances to go somewhere else with their adequate fuel reserves, they didn't make that decision and ended up with an accident. So in this case, uh, don't fl fly like a pro, uh, but uh, manage your fuel carefully. Now, just a quick finish up on this uh, Billings to Hillsborough trip. I know you're all on pins and needles as to how it went. Um, that airplane fortunately had 80-gallon tanks, so I didn't have any fuel problem. Uh, I was able to get the plane back by noon for the, uh, the next customer to take it out. But uh, what I determined, and that's why I said that I want an hour of reserves when I land and no more than three hours in the air, is it was probably one of the worst landings I ever made. And any time you make a terrible landing, there's always a big audience. And yes, the new pilot waiting for the plane was there. The FBO was there, as were several other people. So uh, not only uh, I did get the plane back in time, didn't run out of fuel, but my pride was uh, badly bruised. All right, so uh, the next example of a, uh, a fuel issue that uh, caught someone by surprise it uh, didn't happen on May 18, 1980, but for any of you that uh, are into volcanoes and history, that's the day Mount St. Helens finally erupted. And here's a, a picture of it. And uh, the thing that was interesting about May Mount St. Helens, uh, for all of us pilots in the Portland area, 
this was a great way to introduce friends to aviation. It was about an hour flight from Hillsboro up to St. Helens, a couple loops around it, and then a nice comfortable flight back down to uh, Hillsboro and short enough that everyone enjoyed it, had some scenery and, and things like that. Well, after uh, Mount St. Helens erupted, uh, that was just like catnip to all of us pilots. We were out begging friends to want to go to Mount St. Helens and take a look once they opened up the airspace. So um, we all got a lot of flying in there, and uh, a friend of mine that uh, had a, a small company offered a, um, a benefit to some of his employees. He said, uh, you know, I'd like to take you up flying. Uh, let's go look at Mount St. Helens. It'll be a gorgeous day. You guys have been doing a terrific job for us. You know, one of the, the perks. Uh, this, again, is a Cessna 182. So it's the pilot plus three friends or employees. He had uh, approximately uh, 30 gallons in each tank. Uh, overall, the flight's about 100 nautical miles when you go up and down. This one he'd planned for about an hour and 30 minutes, give him a little more time to look around Mount St. Helens. And the plane was within the gross takeoff uh, weight and center of gravity. And anyone looking at the, the picture here, uh, this is not a 182 doing aerobatics. This is actually a Piper a Warrior that belonged to my uh, father-in-law. And we're looking north. So here's Mount St. Helens. Here's the caldera that blew out. And then there's Mount Rainier off in the horizon. Uh, so uh, very uh, scenic flight. And generally, the way we went that is we would start from Hillsborough Airport here. And you could fly a dog leg up here. And it would keep you out of the Portland International airspace. And then we'd angle off towards Mount St. Helens and do a couple loops up around there and then basically return flight down. Now, we could if we wanted to, and you got clearance, you could go straight through there. And if it wasn't busy, Portland approach and control didn't have any issues with that. But what we found out was that oftentimes your passengers panicked when they looked out and saw an airliner that they thought was heading directly for you like a cruise missile. So the usual path was to fly the dogleg there and uh, stay out of the way or a long distance from the, uh, the airliners. So I'm just going to leave this gorgeous picture up and finish the, uh, the story on there. Everything was going well on it. They, they went up, uh, made some loops around, took some pictures, uh, and were starting back towards the home base. And it turned out that one of the passengers lived in Tigard, Oregon. And Tigard, Oregon is just about here in this map. So it's not too far from Hillsboro. So of course, the next thing that we pilots love to do when we find out that someone lives near an airport or in route is, do you want to go look at your house? Well, who's going to turn that down? So they went to look for uh, the person's house. And this is where, pardon me, I'll get the right photos up here. And this is where one of the personal minimums that the pilot always kept in place uh, saves the day. He said, anytime I'm over a populated area, I'm going to go no lower than an altitude of which I know if I lost an engine, I could glide to an open field. And Portland and Tigard has a pretty strict uh, uh, density growth uh, or boundary for urban sprawl and control. And so he was able to maintain about 3,000 feet, fly over the friend's house, and still know that if he lost an engine, he could fly out uh, to one of the fields and land safely which is good because his engine did stop about the second time they went around looking at the, uh, the person's house. And the reason it stopped with all of that fuel that was in the airplane is the classic interruption during a pre-flight. He had been checking the uh, fuel in one of the fuel tanks. When one of the passengers showed up, asked a question, he thought he got the fuel cap in correctly and snugly uh, fitted in there and then went on to answer the question with the passenger. Um, finished his pre-flight. About the time he always does one last walk around to take a look at the, uh, the wings, make sure nothing fell off since the uh, pre-flight was finished. He got another interruption and said, I really didn't check the fuel caps like I normally do. And so as he was flying, he was siphoning one, wing, one tank totally dry and flying off the other one. So instead of having all the fuel that he thought, he had half the fuel out there. And the other thing he said that uh, it got him in trouble, and something that he didn't do very often, is that this was one where he didn't write down the time and fuel. He was just trying to work off of his uh, memory. So as he was looking at the fuel gauges, 
even though in the back of his mind he said, something's not right here at the time I think I've been flying versus how full that tank is showing just doesn't make sense. But things seem to be going well. Maybe I've leaned it properly, et cetera. Well, what happened, uh, we found out after the off-field landing, was that the suction was strong enough in that tank that it, suffed, it lifted the bladder up off the bottom of the wing and pushed it against the float, which gave a constant false reading of about half full in that fuel tank, even though it was totally empty. So there was a situation where uh, he had thought he had everything, but because he hadn't been writing figures down that would have told him, no, I shouldn't have that much fuel, his memory just played kind of that trick on him that said, yeah, everything looks right. I know something's wrong, but everything still looks right, so let's go with it. So it was check the time and fuel, write it down, and continue to check the time and fuel. Now, the happy ending on this particular story is the crops had been harvested. It was a hay field. It had been a dry uh, summer. So he had a nice, firm, open field that he could land in, which he did. No damage to the airplane, no damage to any of the occupants, no damage to the uh, harvested field. Uh, kind of the downside on this, though, is that it happened right during prime drive time in the morning in the Portland metropolitan area. So as soon as the news stations picked up off the police scanner as he declared an emergency, that we have a plane crashing out by Tigard, Oregon, that got on all the drive time news, got everyone really excited. Uh, in fact, uh, when I came into the office, uh, the uh, young lady that was working in the office with me in Portland at the time said, hey, did you hear about the plane that crashed out by Tigard? And of course, I hadn't because I'd ridden my bicycle to work that day. And it turned out uh, that it hit all the news was a black eye for general aviation. And as the case would be, there wasn't any follow-up news story saying that everyone was safe and the plane safely went back to the airport. It just kind of died after the initial reports of the uh, airplane accident that wasn't an accident. Uh, for the, those of you that are wondering uh, what happened to the pilot, uh, yes, he did have to talk to the FAA. Uh, went through some calculations on fuel burn and consumption. Uh, they talked to the maintenance shop of the 182. And uh, other than that, that's all that uh, happened in that case. No suspensions or violations or anything like that. Now, in full disclosure, uh, someone asked me, what about the clips that should have held the, uh, the bladder in place? And I've got to be honest, um, I don't know the condition of the clips or the bladder themselves. Uh, but it was the maintenance, uh, it was the mechanic that said, yeah, if the you get a good siphon in there, it will lift the tank up off the bladder up off the bottom of the wing and give you a false fuel reading. So if you're still flying 182s and they have the flexible bladders, uh, pay attention to that. Okay, uh, one more last story here, and then we'll uh, open it up for questions. Uh, for anyone that's been out flying in the Pacific Northwest, uh, we had great landmarks for our student cross countries. And this here is the uh, Three Sisters in the Three Sisters Wilderness Area in the Oregon Cascades. This is the North Sister here, Middle Sister, and South Sister. And the flight schools in the Willamette Valley and actually over in eastern Oregon loved these because they were great landmarks to send students on for solo cross, long solo cross countries. And you could almost never get lost. So what this is, is this is a student pilot on their long solo cross country flying a Cessna 150. Um, and if you look at the pilot operating handbook, uh, we look at the, uh, the ranges and powers that uh, the student could have made on a standard uh, tankable uh, airplane, 340 nautical miles at 7,000 feet. He could get it up to 420 nautical miles if he was up at 10,000 feet. And because he had to cross the Cascades, we can assume that the altitudes were mostly at 7,000 feet and above once he departed uh, Hillsboro uh, uh, Airport. So we've got uh, some pretty good information on the airplane. And here is the route that the student takes. We, they start up here in Hillsboro. And what's nice about this trip is this is Mount Hood, which is a pretty distinctive landmark. Uh, this here, this little peak here is probably Mount Jefferson. Um, you might have Mount Washington down here. So as long as you take off and you keep Mount Hood on your left wing, Jefferson on your right wing, you're going to get somewhere around Redmond, Oregon, which has a nice big airport. And if you don't see the airport right away, you're going to see this nice big highway, and you can either fly north or south. If you fly north, you hit the Columbia River Gorge, and there's Hood River Airport. 
you better just go ahead and land and call the uh, FBO to come and get you. Uh, you're pretty well lost. If you head south, and pretty soon you can see a couple other airports down here, so you can still land at those. But you've got a nice uh, you know, climb all the way up through the peak, then you descend down into Redmond. And then the second leg is you've now got the Three Sisters, which are down here. Off your right wing, you've got Crater Lake down here as a nice landmark. You've got a couple other lakes. You've got Eastern Oregon out here. And you come into Medford, Oregon, which is in a nice little bowl just north of Medford, just north of the Oregon-California border. And then from there, it's a duck soup to get home because you can do the uh, iron compass or the uh, asphalt compass if you want. This route along through here is Interstate 5, and it takes you virtually straight back to Hillsboro, Oregon. So if you can't remember to keep the Three Sisters on your right at this point, the ocean on your left, or the coast range, you still have a nice route to follow up to get home. As you can see, we've got some good legs here. We've got 109 nautical miles, 136, and then 190 gets you home. So the uh, student went off on their cross country. The instructor had briefed them that, yes, you're going to have to pur purchase fuel out here because you really can't make it all the way. And the recommended place to buy fuel is down here in, in Medford. Well, um, you can all guess where the student bought the fuel. They got to Redmond. They landed. Knew they had to buy the fuel, so they went ahead and, and purchased the fuel and then set off for Medford. And long about this time, in the back of their mind, they're thinking, well, something's not quite right. Uh, I know I had to buy fuel, but boy, it seems like I shouldn't have bought it after 100 and, you know, like of 109 nautical miles. Landed in Medford, got out the pilot operating handbook, looked at everything, ran through the calculations, and correctly calculated that they had enough fuel to get back to Hillsboro without having to buy any more fuel in Medford. And here's a, I want to go on a, a little bit of a thing we've noticed here, and it has to do with um, how FBOs rent their aircraft either wet or dry. And if they rent, and I'm not throwing stones on the, at the FBO or anyone, I'm just pointing this out because we often say something and yet we communicate something totally different that we didn't know we were communicating to the student pilot. And that's that you can rent the airplane wet, and if you buy fuel on the road, we'll reimburse you for the fuel on the road, but we'll not pay any more than what it would have cost us to purchase the fuel at our home base. So here we have a, an FBO that um, had a, negotiated a pretty good deal at their home base for their airplanes. We've got a student that's on the road. Uh, the tax structure, the municipal tax structure is a little different in Medford, as are some other fees. And so one of the things the student may have been thinking, and I'm speculating on this, is that, okay, I've just added the cost of my trip because I'm only going to be reimbursed, let's say at the time, $2 a gallon, because that's what the FBO can buy at, at uh, Hillsboro, versus I'm paying two and a quarter a gallon if I buy it down here in Medford. The pilot operating handbook says, I can make it. I'm not going to buy fuel. Now, I don't have a solution to that conundrum. I'm just pointing it out that you know, if you're talking to your travelers or those, uh, you might let them know that that little bit extra money they may have to pay out of pocket is very good insurance to make sure they make it. So, uh, <clears throat> at this point in the, uh, this, the saga, uh, I start to get a, a raising of hands of how far anyone thinks the student got. Uh, this is Eugene, Oregon, nice big municipal airport there, home of the Mighty Ducks that always beat the Oregon State Beavers. Uh, up here actually is Corrales, Oregon with the Oregon State Beavers. Salem, Oregon, the state capital, has a nice airport, Independence Air Parks over here. You can wander on up, and here is uh, McMinnville that used to have the Evergreen Air Museum, Aurora where we had the other incidents just right over here, uh, Shehalem. And then we've got the Starks, Twin Oaks, and Hillsboro. So a whole variety of airports that the individual, all with fuel, by the way, that the individual flew over. And I'll just go ahead and say that uh, everyone, a lot of people say, well, the student didn't make it to Hillsboro. You know, he got somewhere around Salem, ran out of fuel, crashed out somewhere. Uh, much to everyone's surprise, the student did make it to Hillsboro. The trouble is he didn't make it to the Hillsboro airport. Uh, this is the classic crashed into a city park two miles south of the airport. 
the good news is that he got caught in some very tall trees. Uh, no one on the ground was injured. The airplane did turn out to be a total loss. The pilot was not injured, uh, but it was a, a lot of negative press again for general aviation with a picture of the airplane. And I, this is long enough ago I couldn't find a photo from the Hillsboro Argus uh, with that, but it was rather classic of the plane up in the tree and, of course, everyone getting the pilot and stuff out. So the, uh, the FAA got kind of interested in this because when it happened virtually in their backyard of their uh, office, so they sat down and uh, were going to work with the instructor, make sure the instructor knew what he was doing. And when they got finished with the instructor, everything had been done properly. The uh, flight school had all the documentation of how they brief each student for this cross country, where they tell them to get the fuel. They ran them through the weight and balance, the fuel calculations, and they said, well, the student must not have known what he was doing, uh, so let's go talk to the student. Well, the student was, at, was able to demonstrate uh, thorough knowledge and experience in leaning for altitudes, uh, calculations on fuel burn and stuff per the pilot operating handbook. And at the end of the day, um, because everyone had done everything per the specs, no one had any suspensions or violations or check rides on it. They'd all done everything correctly uh, with the information they had. So you can't really go back and fault the individual for that so much. But what it turned out is you do need to take a look at the condition of the airplane. Uh, we all knew how uh, training 150s are, how clean and aerodynamic they are. We know how strong an engine is when it has 1,500 hours on it versus 50 hours, et cetera. But there isn't anything that is in the pilot operating handbook that allows any of us to point to it and say, here's the amount that you need to increase your fuel burn, slow down your air speeds, et cetera, due to um, age of aircraft or overall condition. Now, weather uh, on there, because everyone's going, well, what was the weather condition? It was clear weather. Uh, normally, when we have clear weather in the summertime, we have a high pressure up in Canada, which is way up here, and we get a little bit of a, a north wind, wind out of the north. It was light and variable that day, so the winds may have had a, a factor on it, um, but the, the student you know, cruised along, thought that they had everything set up, except maybe what the fuel gauges were telling them. But if we look at what's one of the things that we always tell ourselves about airplanes is that fuel gauges are only accurate when they're showing dead empty. So maybe by what we say through uh, word of mouth or urban myths and things is giving a new pilot the wrong impression about how they should really look at their fuel gauges. So what did we learn on this in closing thoughts so we can uh, get on uh, to your questions? Uh, we need to set personal minimums, and we need to adhere to those personal minimums. We need to be honest with ourselves. And then that kind of gets into the ethics. If you set the minimums, even if no one is there watching you, you need to adhere to them because you know you've set the minimums. You need to hold the standard. If you're going to stop for gas, like Bob said, you've got to get the gas. You need to plan for the unplanable. It is a predicted fuel burn accurate. Um, Tom Taylor uh, writes a, a good uh, article uh, about uh, going up and flying, doing an accurate measurement of the uh, fuel burned, then comparing it to what the pilot operating handbook says. Now, don't rely 100% on the pilot operating handbook. You need to use that as a good gauge, but you need to check it yourself. Do a, a couple of tests. Now, granted, this is easier to do in your own airplane, but if you're flying an older rental aircraft, such as what I do, then you need to add a little bit more margin for fuel on that. And then lastly, and I'll open it up, please promote the FAA WINGS program. Uh, any of the pilots that earn the WINGS, uh, if they click the button that says, yes, I want to get the WINGS, Avemco is the insurance company that pays for them and mails them out to you. We would like to buy a lot more. We'd like to mail a lot more. And uh, this is a three-way win-win for all of us. One, more students getting the WINGS program is good for you because it means you get to do more instruction, which keeps your skills sharp. It's good for the, your clients because they are less likely to have an accident. And that's good for Avemco because of number two. And if we have less accidents, we can keep the premiums under control, which saves all of the aviators money, which allows them more flying, which means they can take more lessons, and that gets us back to number one again, and the cycle starts all over again. 
So please promote the WINGS programs. And with that, I'll open it up to any questions, Bob, or uh, things like that. You can call them. Uh, well, let's see, tonight it will go over to our uh, answering service at uh, the Triple Eight. Uh, my uh, direct extension for anyone that wants it is 4130. Uh, you can call our standard 800 number and ask to talk to me, and I'll answer the phone if I'm available. Uh, also, if you do want to uh, send me an email or have questions uh, that you don't want to answer answered tonight, uh, my email is pretty simple. It's my first initial, Mike, last name Adams, so madams at ave alpha victor echo dot com. Know that. Okay. Bob, I'll Al turn Alpha, over to you. Alpha Vic, is it a Vemco dot com or AVE? Actually, you can if you like to type, you can type in a Vemco, the word a Vemco dot com, or you can abbreviate AVE dot com. Both, I've got both emails. Okay, great. I just I just wanted to make sure because I'm looking at the screen and wanted to make sure everything mm -hmm. was clear. Okay, very good. Well, uh, since since this is not, we don't get a lot of students on there. By the way. For all you instructors, you're welcome to bring your students on to these conversations. We'd love to have them. Um, we got a whole squadron of uh, instructors. Um, how how do you guys do this? And I'll, I'll tell you how I handle, for example, the solo cross country to reinforce go get gas. I tell my students the only way I know you went on your cross country is if you bring me back two two fuel receipts. I want to see them, and that's how I enforce it. And it, you know, it, and I make it a game. I, I sound really harsh here, but I just hey, bring back the fuel receipts. I want to see, uh, you know, that's how I know you went and had a good time. How do you guys do it? Any any suggestions? Any way? You, any way you all uh, reinforce with your students to pick up gas or not succumb to pressure? Al Rice has got a good com comment. Fuel is cheap, no matter the cost. I like that one. We got a lot of smart people on here. I don't. I don't want to do all the talking. Anybody got any uh, any great thoughts? No. I've got one other short story. If uh, anyone would be interested, or the time, uh, because I know probably one of the challenges is uh, the pilot that says, "Well, well, I've got the fanciest avionics. I've got a fuel totalizer, and I'm never going to have this problem." <laughs> Uh, you know, I'll cut this down. I was making a presentation at the uh, Great Minnesota Aviation Gathering, and at the end of the presentation, someone in the audience said, do you mind if I share a personal experience uh, with you, and one you can use this in your presentations if you want? So I said, sure. It's a, a Piper Meridian that was owned by a husband and wife. They have a fuel totalizer. They made a trip that totaled 35 flight hours, about 7,000 miles. And what they did is they went from Minnesota through Canada up to Alaska. Their son was uh, flying as a professional pilot in Alaska for the summer. Went out to uh, Kotzebue, wandered around for a while in uh, parts of uh, Alaska, then flew down to Bellingham, Washington, and from Bellingham, Washington, back to Minnesota. Uh, for anyone that uh, wants to go from Washington to Alaska and not stop in Canada and go through customs, if you have enough fuel, Sometimes you can get from Bellingham all the way up to, uh, to Ketchikan or that area. And there's also an airport, and John and Martha, feel free to jump in, that you can land in Canada. And as long as you don't get off the airport, you don't have to clear customs. You can buy, say, uh, fuel and take off again. But back to this story, uh, what they did, because of the equipment they were carrying, you know, they were not uh, able to go to full fuel and still be within the uh, – published gross takeoff uh, weights and limitations. So they started out with a partial fuel and calculated how much fuel they thought they had in it. The wife, who is the private instrument rated pilot, uh, was the load master uh, for this. And so she said, I calculated liters to gallons and liters and gallons to pounds and ounces and all kinds of things. And we kept updating stuff. She said, but one of the things that happened is when we got to Alaska and we were talking to our son about you know, fuel and all this work we had to do to make sure we had fuel for the legs because we couldn't ever go full, he said, um, why don't you, while you're up here, why don't you just go ahead and uh, throw in a little more extra fuel than uh, you think you can take off with because, one, look at the size of the runways that you're taking off from. Look at the air temperatures. So you're going to get lots of power out of that engine. And everyone up here unofficially does that because it gives us a margin of error. 
So she said that's what they started to do. They just started to calculate what they needed to put back into the plane, stay within the, their parameters, and then add a little bit. And she said uh, what surprised them is when they landed in Minnesota at their home airport, when they, and we've all done this as pilots, they called out the fuel truck, and because we're all curious as to how accurate our fuel calculations are, we hang around to see how much fuel was put in there, and we either feel real good or real bad. This uh, woman said that by the time they had filled up the tanks, they realized that they had four usable gallons left when they got to their hangar. Oh had they had to do a go around, they would have had an engine stoppage or a flame out and would have landed off airport. So any of your clients that say, I've got fuel totalizers, and boy, you know, they're accurate as everything, um, long legs, long trips, you can always factor in some kind of a, an error there that's going to get you into trouble unless you can reset it full each time. Wow. Yeah, one of the things I've noticed a lot of times when I get into airplanes is, especially rentals, I'll climb in and for Garmin 430s. I've got a nice little, you know, it's 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 based on time. It's not a real totalizer unless it's wired to a totalizer. But a lot of times I'll get in and it's set and it's sitting on zero. And I'll look at and I'll look at the pilot and say, why is this on zero? And he goes, well, uh, it's, it's, he he just got they never they don't get in the habit of resetting it after the plane's filled uh, filled up. So there's there's a tool that's just not even use, usable at that point. And I, I why would you not, why would you not use this? And it, it's a, it's an aid. It's a way of making sure that you know your your situation. It's one more tool in the airplane. Why not use it? Mm-hmm. Um Several years ago, um, there was an incident, I recall, at our FBO in St. Louis where somebody flew, you probably paid for it, um, flew may from have. St. Louis, <laughs> may have, flew from St. Louis to um, Asheville, North Carolina, and they landed on the Biltmore Estate. Basically, the system. And there was no damage to the aircraft. Uh, nobody got hurt. The plane, they were able to get the plane out. There's a fun, there was a funny picture of a bunch of cows looking at the airplane. But when the F, F, FAA came out, I don't out, think they get paid for this. Um, when the uh, when the FAA came out and uh, looked at it, this is um, word, the word they um, uh, they asked the pilot, you know, for all his planning, and he had perfect planning right down to the ounce. And he landed one mile short of the airport, and uh, it came down to the the, uh, the inspector said, "Do you really believe the charts in the airplane?" And they did come back to the CFI on that one and said, "Why didn't you teach them to factor in twenty percent or what something like that?" So, even though it may be perfect planning, as Mike said. Uh, the plane, uh, the plane's not brand new. It's not perfect. It's not perfectly broken in, and so on. So that uh, that's the kind of thing that we have to watch for. Let's see, uh, two uh, two other things. I'm just looking through my notes here. For anyone that's interested, I can give you the NTSB reports if you want to read uh, about the student. Although that one's very short, it just basically says the student ran out of short, uh, out of fuel short of the field. But if you're interested in the uh, one on um, but B17, uh, that's uh, NTSB report uh, Charlie Echo November 11 Foxtrot Alpha 383. Uh, I remember when that happened. I'm so, I'm grateful everybody got out of got out of here. What a shame. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what I was hoping to find is uh, Don Sokol, who ran the FBO in Astoria, Oregon, for a number of years, had a picture on his wall of a B-17 where the uh, outboard wing tip outside the outside engine was basically burned off on the uh, the pilot side. And so I asked him about that picture, and 
he said, well, that was his B-17 that uh, had been shot up and they were returning home from a mission. And uh, he said that's the uh, only time that he really felt that he had too much fuel on there. way to this stuff. <laughs> on there, but on, unfortunately I couldn't find that photo, and uh, hopefully not, one of Don's uh, relatives has it in their uh, archives versus it uh, getting lost in history. Mm, yeah, that's one of those pictures that you hope Martin Caden, well, he's passed away, but he wrote several histories of the B-17, and you hope it's one of those that uh, was preserved. 